We will see my film 20 to 21 Rhythms of History together afterwards, which premiered in October 2021 at the Donau Eschingen Music Festival in a movie theater in the city. Work on the piece began at the end of 2018. It was completed in autumn 2021, just before the premiere. So the work took almost three years with interruptions. The film lasts 46 minutes. I would like to preface this with a few words in the hope that the first glimpses of the work uh, before it is seen in its entirety will deepen understanding and perhaps inspire further participation in the interpretation. In the program note, I wrote that here, film is understood as a medium of reflection of music and music as a medium of reflection of film. I would like to elaborate on that. At my inaugural lecture at the Hochschule für Musik Basel, the topic was conceptual listening. My thesis was that our listening today is deeply interspersed with linguistic knowledge, that working with sound is always also working with concepts, with concepts as a work of society as well as of the composer. We hear Beethoven as Beethoven. We hear a symphony as a symphony, or we hear a song as a song and not just as anything. So this seems so tautologic, yeah? but when we hear a song, we do not say, ah, oh, yeah, there is some sound information. No, it is a song, and ah, this is Beethoven. Yeah? And we hear music not as any sound information, we hear music as music. We call this phenomenon music, we have the term for it. And we don't hear music as non-music. I think it's almost impossible to hear this music, but, we, uh, but it's, I don't call this music. So no, we hear this immediately as music. We hear Beethoven not as not Beethoven, oh, here in German. <clears throat> But we hear the music of Beethoven as the music not of anyone, but of it is the music of Beethoven. And also, a cray picture is not simply cray, it exemplifies the cray. Yeah? That's the philosophy of the, um, of, or the, an idea of the philosopher uh, Nelson Goodman, who, also, who wrote about the exemplification. That a cray picture is exemplifying the cray. It is not just cray. We see also we have the idea of cray when we see the, this image. Such terms are already existing attributions and nominal contextualizations on the one hand with which one continues to work as an artist. On the other hand, I can also prepare terms in a new or at least altered way, set them and bring them into relationships, prepare the listening the way Cage prepared the piano, with other media as additions such as text or video and performance. All this brought together, for example, in a music film. It seems to me that this relatively new or not yet much practiced genre of the new music cinema film is now beginning to establish itself in new music as a veritable practice of its own, a genre in its own right. More and more festivals for new music also are also renting a cinema hall and organizing film screenings. My approach in the film 20 to 21, Rhythms of History, is mainly these three visualizations of sound the sheet music, the sound waves, and the instruments. The fourth could also be called the performance, uh, the act of music making, which however also essentially includes an instrument. But the special feature of the first three mentioned is that they, more than the performance, even function without sound. Sheet music, sound waves, and instruments represent sound without sounding. This decoupling gives me certain freedoms to say something about sound, about music, and beyond music. Yet it resonates internally, or of course it also can resonate normally. For example, frozen sound waves. If the sound wave representation is no longer a function in time, which of course is constantly changing, but any moments in time are frozen, captured, then I form a kind of archive of sounds and can thus produce a representation and reflection of the archiving, 
the memorizing, the remaining or sedimenting of sound of music. To express precisely this idea, our hearing is always interspersed with knowledge, with experience. So here, film as a medium of reflection of music or reflection for music. And vice versa, music as a medium of reflection for film. Film is used to the cut. The program text says, in music, one is used to the unity of performance, that is, live performance on stage. You can cut a melody, but you can hardly cut a cello and not its player, not the present. Performance can be heterogeneous at all, cannot be heterogeneous at all. In this practice, in the here and now, there is no suddenness. Everything has its organic catching up, breathing. There is only its own time. So the cello player, you can make a very cut up score, but the cello player is anyway always doing this. You cannot cut the movement of the cello player live on stage. So um, there's only the own time of the stage. Film, on the other hand, needs to no prelude. Montage is the art of no prelude of shocks. Now, so the idea of montage uh, roots back to the filmmaker Sergei Eisenstein, who for the first was had the idea, okay, we take several footage perspectives on the same scene, and then I cut this together to one montage. Now, editing in film is usually something that functions invisibly, so to speak. The abrupt change is mitigated as much as possible by the unity of the scene and by the music, which remains the same throughout each cut. So, in a way, it glues everything together. Here is a completely arbitrary example. This is now in German, but it doesn't matter at all. It's not about uh, whatever language, and anyway, I, I think you, you get it. Offenbar haben Sie nicht verstanden, falls es eine Frage der Methoden ist, aber da gibt es keine Frage. Sie haben keine. Laut der Verfügung in meiner Tasche sehr wohl. Diese Überprüfung von Recrime und seinem Personal erfolgt unter Aufsicht und mit ausdrücklicher Erlaubnis vom Generalstaatsanwalt der Vereinigten Staaten. How many cuts was it? Of course, nobody counts it in such a scene. It's 11 cuts have been here, but they are not at all breaks. Yeah? It's simply the quite the standard, standardized film language and everything is glued together by the music, which doesn't have cuts, and of course, by the unity of the scene. <clears throat> I, on the other hand, now use the music to emphasize the cut in reverse. Hard cuts in almost every perspective. In this, there is a reference to the organ piece uh, Les Mains de la Bime of Olivier Messiaen. Yeah. Yeah, so. <clears throat> so here is a reference to the organ piece Les Mains de la Bime of Olivier Messiaen from the Livre Dog, where he juxtaposes extremely long and extremely short durations. transferred to film, I once wanted to return film to its basic visual unit 
the individual frame, of which, in my case, technically speaking, 25 run per second, and thus, as is well known, create the illusion of movement, a kind of digital process that from static individual moments through rapid succession, the eye or our brain uh, is tricked and we see this smooth movement, this as a smooth movement. Yeah? And in this case, however, there are these interjections of sometimes two or down to just a single frame of a different kind, similar to Messiaen's additive rhythms. This is the basic computational building block, the single frame from which any editing rhythm can be set. As a rule, musical rhythms are divisive. We divide the whole into two halves, four quarters, eight eighths, and so on. Whereas in film, I actually leave so and so many individual frames. So I don't divide a second into several equal parts, uh, but give each piece so and so much time. And so the basis of the grid of my individual frames, as the basis grid of my individual frame is. So film editing is therefore additive rhythm. Yeah? Messiaen was, so to speak, a musical editor. And perhaps not by chance he came up with the idea of this edit additive rhythms at about the same time as Sergei Eisenstein invented film editing, so around 1930. You see, now I'm already talking in quite some detail about rhythm, time, and history, the subject of my film. Two other related scenes. The photographing of sound production. I've done this before in a piano piece uh, called Steady Shot, uh, where, which was also, uh, so in, yeah, Steady Shot, where she is with the right hand, is photographing her left hand, so to speak, like uh, other famous pieces for the, only the left hand for piano. So in the film, now this occurs in two variations. Once the moment is captured photographically, and then further work is done with this artifact. The photo taken at the moment of impact is hung up, thrown away, folded, torn, etc. <laughs> In the other scene, I have again, so to speak, grouped the individual moments, the individual frames into a family album. Accordingly, there uh, are different chords, intervals in the succession of the book pages, including the rhythm of turning the pages. And so I can, of course, also turn the pages back, turn back time. On the other hand, the cohesion is not necessarily given. Some photos fall out again, as it is with time. The clue does not last forever. With the example, I can also notice a bit about the compositional technique. You can see a formal procedure that is often used in my film and also in other works of mine. There is a concept for a scene, 
the concept can be realized in many, many variations. So I create this series of concept realizations, and these are then played in this, in this series form. In the case of the album, the form even literally corresponds to the turning of the individual pages. But this is not just somehow an arbitrary list, but naturally develops a dramaturgy. A principle is presented or introduced, variations are formed, that is, the concept behind all the variations crystallizes. And the more this is established, the more I can, in turn, stretch the concept, provide a certain surprise. Often I then come up with a final punchline, as in these two scenes. In one case, the pianist suddenly holds a photo of himself in the camera, or in the other case, the photos move themselves, so to speak. They escape from the album context. Or it is the natural force of gravity, another means I like to use, that takes them out of the state they were first created in. And I want to move from the time moment, from rhythm to history. Sound visualization is sound transformation. And what can be transformed can also be stored. Sound visualization is sound archiving and thus a historizing moment. He who writes stays, as the saying says in Goes in German, wer schreibt, der bleibt. And as it is said, in the musical theory of form, form is rhythm on a large scale. So that was uh, music, uh, musicologist Karl Dahlhaus uh, saying he was fond of using the phrase. So conversely, one can again speak of rhythms in history. For example, rhythms in natural history such as the succession of geological eras in which man, keyword Anthropocene, is now also involved, the per periodicity of cold and hot times in which man now also intervenes, keyword climate change. Both keywords again gain their relevance precisely in the comparison of times, in the observation of tempi, and in the case in the case of their blatant acceleration. In history, there are proportions, accelerandi and retardandi, slowness and speed, accent, transition, and contrast. These frozen sound waves in the film are, on the one hand, retrospective, they are filed away, in accordance with the Hegelian dictum that philosophy only begins its business in the evening, when the day with its events has come to an end. So it works with the sound that have always already cooled down. On the other hand, it is not only a retrospective, but also a view on the f of the future when such things appear in a deserted concert hall or even in outer space. This is science fiction, which always says something about our present, that is about the past of the future, in the guise of the future. But there is also, at the beginning and at the end of the film, a formal bracket, the expression of radical presence. The introduction of the piece places itself very accentuated in the topos of a introduction. We see a world at twilight, dawn, a classical beginning, uh, like of the fifth, like uh, beginning of a fifth as an interval, like in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, or Bruckner's Ninth Symphony, or Strauss's Zarathustra, rising from this primordial soup, as it were, here as the primal cry of the individual. I think that can be read quite clearly at first. Now this opening scene further represents the positions that Nietzsche contrasts in his early text on the use and abuse of history for life. Nietzsche, consider the herds that are feeding yonder. They know not the meaning of yesterday or today. They graze and ruminate, move or rest, from morning to night, from day to day, taken up with their little loves and hates at the mercy of the moment, feeling neither melancholy nor satiety. The man may ask the beast, why do you look at me and not speak to me of your happiness? 
The beast wants to answer, because I always forget what I wished to say. But he forgets this answer too and is silent, and the man is left to wonder. He wonders also about himself, that he cannot learn to forget, but he hangs on the past. However far or fast he runs, the chain runs with him. Nietzsche distinguishes in this untimely contemplation the human being who, in extreme cases, only lives in history or is completely crushed and destroyed by it. This is a position that we have encountered in recent de decades in Baudrillard's philosophy in particular, that the present only ever produces repetitions, that is, simulations. Nietzsche contrasts this with the human being, or in the extreme case, the simple animal who lives solely in the present without any idea of the past or the future. An equally unfortunate position, which in its blind inability to learn, experiences every happiness anew, but also runs into the knife of every misfortune and makes progress impossible. This is probably why Francis Fukuyama's overly optimistic idea of the end of history, which he associated with the triumph of capitalism in the 1990s, met with such a fierce wave of objection. The idea of a historyless time, however paradisical it is meant to be, can hardly be imagined in any other way than as an unholy chaos in which it is not history that has ended, but the ability to think history. I try to express these two positions here. First, the voice produces history in heaps until it literally outgrows itself and itself and suffocates it. Then, in one act, all history is disposed of. But now everything uttered also falls immediately into this orcus of, of, of oblivion. And with it, ultimately, the voice itself leaving its mouth alone. <laughs> and all other mouths. This is the philosophical, philosophical gaze from a somehow attempted outside which in the beginning was itself still in the mouth and detached itself from it. In a sense, there is also something in it. In the beginning was the word. This could be interpreted much further, but I will leave it at, at that and look at its counterpart. At the end of the film... Good evening. The duration of this sentence is 5.1 seconds. The duration of this sentence is 4.7 seconds. The duration of this sentence is 6.5 seconds. The duration of the following sentence is 5.9 seconds. Here too, the radical present after the previous excursion into the farthest reaches and heights of a science fiction world and abstraction. Now the news of the day. What she is telling us is precisely the duration of what she says, the empty self-reference, the encapsulation in the moment, if there is such a thing. Of course, she can only determine the total duration of her sentences at the end of each sentence, or the statement will only then become true whereby she magically knows now how to say this at the end, even at the beginning of her sentence. You will see later. At this point, let's briefly turn back the technical to the technical, which is perhaps also interesting now. So how, how did I do this trick? Okay, but you think you can, she can really so precise that she really does 5.9 seconds? Uh, 
Yes. <laughs> okay, so it's both things. So first, she is a musician, yeah. So she can really precisely speak these rhythms. As you see, I've written down it uh, entirely, and um, but still, it's not absolutely perfect. But then, with film editing, you can it perfectly adjust without losing um, quality. Yeah. So at least within a range of 10%, you can stretch it um, or yeah, correct it without having a obvious loss of information or any glitches. Yeah. <clears throat> and you will see afterwards, the whole thing also has this variation form. So his, the scene has a variation form with a final punchline. I think this stupefaction effect, effect creates a certain spellbound, spellboundness to the moment that is being thematized. And with that, the film closes, releasing the viewer back into the here and now. I come back to these three basic building blocks of my filmic work, which uh, with time, temporality of sound and music, the sheet music, the sound waves and, uh, and the instruments. First again, the sound waves, uh, their representation as a curve. In them, I always see a dialectic of oscillation, of movement, also of the time axis from left to right. And on the other hand, the fixation in the coordinate system, the completed snapshot, and the possibility of its accumulation. Just as this is used as visual material in the film, I have also placed it elsewhere in very static of the image in works, which sound, which sound then can be hung on walls or installed in space. Such works were also exhibited in Donaueschingen in the cinema of the cinema of the premiere in the uh, in the anteroom. Then there are the instruments. There is especially this scene with the street, where is almost an endless column of instruments. That was difficult for some to understand at the premiere, especially in its slowness. I can point a little without trying too hard to references like the motorway, motorway drive in Andrei Tarkovsky's Solaris. Uh, a scene which takes, I think, f five or six minutes uh, right during an ordinary film narrative, then suddenly there's this drive and just the drive for five or six or seven minutes. All this endless traffic jam in Jean-Luc Godard's weekend. A really cruel scene. Yeah, it kind of takes a forever. Feels feels like it doesn't stop anymore. They are simply going along this yeah, view into society. Of course, all these uh, people here in this traffic jam. In both cases, as in mine, a formal over length. Yeah? But this has its function precisely in the expression of the extreme stretching. This piano, the performance of artifacts. At a similar point. Only then, in reverse motion, we see church organs in the desert later in the film, and there are the sign says, sound fades away, musical instruments remain. So uh, we know about the oldest musical practices, like those of the ancient Egyptians, the Assyrians, or the Greeks and Romans, just from their instruments, of their images. The sound fades, the instrument remains. And is there before the sound? And so we see and walk past this almost a bestiary of instruments, sometimes wedged into each other, fused and sculpturally autonomized, and seen from the car. And if you look very closely, you will even find a reference to Albrecht Dürer, Dürer's Melancholia. In the overlong temporal part of the form, is the overlong piano, which we follow from the lowest to the highest note. But the distance in between seems to be indefinitely divided, as in Zeno's paradox, and besides, perhaps it's always just the same pitch, at least that's what we hear.
I'll leave it for now with these approaches to an interpretation. A concept is never identical with its interpretation. Interpretation comes first and then always in the plural any interpretations. Again, on the instruments. The musician and philosopher Benjamin Sprick speaks in his recently published dissertation Resonances of the Virtual, a musical cinematography. The musician, um, he speaks with a remarkable matter-of-factness of his instrument, he's a cellist, as a philosopher of a cello philosophy, that in, say, cello philosophical terms, this could be discussed in such or such a way, etc. <laughs> so in this sense, the instruments of an instrumental philosophy are also listed here or in my music theater, Selbstauslöser from 2019. This was my main theme. And thirdly, the sheet music. I'm gradually coming to the end of my remarks, and thus the last major section of the film, the coda, so I have to skip now uh, many other parts. This coda is code. The music becomes text, science, and this again has to do with the thesis expressed at the beginning about conceptual listening, about the linguistic or conceptual knowledge that always surrounds our hearing. Again, historically, Adorno spoke of the tendency of musical material in the philosophy of new music. Well, and this tendency is quite clear to me, that tendency towards nominalization or conceptualization, I could say. Sound, and that is every sound, um, has lost its innocence. We now hear Beethoven as Beethoven. The textuality of sound is presented as a vanishing point of music in the coda after the action has already flown off into a distant science fiction future. Whether you think this is good or terrible is up to your judgment, your interpretation. So much uh, for a few approaches, beginnings, opening sentences, of interpretation of the work. Now form your own.